So it will be by Marcel Darniol on the necessity of collapsing for post quantum and quantum commitments. And I also should point out that this is the winner of the TQC Outstanding Paper Prize. So congratulations to you and we'll pay extra attention. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, so uh, should I just get started or wait for the three minutes, I guess that um, I'm, I'm happy to do either. I, I think you can just get started. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, and I, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. This would have been a uh, you know, great opportunity to, uh, to meet, see Portugal and be somewhere where they speak my language, but um, unfortunately it did not work out. Um, so I'm going to talk about it's a recent work with Nick Spooner um, on um, certain sort of like uh, fundamental notions in, in quantum cryptography. And uh, I should say that like there's a longer version of this presentation online. So I'll spend a reasonable amount of time going through proofs here, uh, but only at sort of like a somewhat high level. If you want the details, please feel free to, to check that out. So if this piques your interest, um, there's, there's a longer version available as well. Um, okay, so I'll divide this into like three parts. Um, First, to give you an introduction uh, to some notions in classical cryptography. So for the time being, everything is classical. Um, then I'll mention so like some complications that arise when uh, these adversaries, even if the, uh, the scheme is classical, if the adversary is quantum, certain things might break down. Um, and that's where sort of like one of our main results is. And then I'll mention sort of like a second part, uh, a second set of results that has to do with quantum rewinding. Okay. So uh, let me sort of like first introduce the, you know, the, the main object of interest here uh, in our paper, which is uh, the notion of commitment schemes. And a commitment scheme is just you know, some uh, protocol between two parties, a sender and a receiver, that computationally realizes the following sort of like physical protocol. You know, the sender wants to send a message to the receiver, but it wants the receiver to only be able to read the message once the sender has authorized it to. So what it can do is it can write this message down in a piece of paper, put it in a, a safe, lock the safe, and then send the safe without the message. So at this point, the receiver has you know, a locked box that it cannot peer into. Um, and then whenever the receiver uh, allows the sender to uh, open this box, it just sends the key. And then the receiver opens the box and can read what's inside. And in this case, you know, the message is some bit B. Um, I should note here that, um, we will only focus like commitment schemes uh, satisfy two notions, sort of hiding and binding. Binding means that whenever the sender has sent a message, it cannot change its mind. And hiding means that the receiver cannot read the message before receiving the key. We'll only focus on binding. So for all we care, all of these results apply just the same to the case where the sender sends a message in a transparent box. Um, and of course, this is not like the interesting case, but I should highlight that you know we're only going to focus on like one of the two characterizing um, properties of, of commitment schemes. Uh, something else that I should note is that in order to keep things simple, um, I'll focus on bit commitment schemes where the messages are all classical, but all of these results generalize to the case where the messages are strings rather than bits, and where both like the locked box and the and the key could be quantum states. So uh, throughout this talk. All of the messages that are sent back and forth are just classical messages, but the, the results extend to when they are quantum as well. Okay, so a bit more formally, a uh, bit commitment scheme consists of two algorithms with the following syntax. A generator receives as input a, some security parameter lambda and samples a key. And the idea is that you know, the key, uh, it, it should be harder to break the system the larger the security parameter is. And uh, the commitment just takes in a key, a bit, and some extra amount of randomness that we'll call it an opening. And with those three, it generates some string. Um, and we say, you know, in this parlance, like in this uh, setting, we say that um, some string omega opens the commitment C to the bit B if this identity is satisfied. So just to go back to this previous picture, you know, the locked box uh, in the commitment serves the, the, the role as the locked box, and the opening serves the same, the same role as the, the key. Okay, 
So um, now that we sort of like define what these are, we need some way of comparing uh, the the um, performance of sort of different commitment schemes, right? And the way we do this is by uh, you know, stating some notions of security. I'll mention two uh, in in the classical case: computational and some binding. And I'll, I'll mention like what they have to do with one another in a bit. So computational binding is rather standard. It's probably something that you've all seen. Um, we say that a scheme is computationally binding if, if we sample a key, hand it off to some polynomial time adversary, and it replies with two openings, the probability that these openings are valid to distinct bits should be very, very small. And in you know, cryptography, the notion of very, very small is smaller than any inverse polynomial, which we call negligible. Okay, so this is uh, computational binding, but I'll argue that in fact, like it's in order to compare this to different notions, it's useful to think of computational binding as a game where we have an adversary on the right-hand side and a challenger that will try to, you know, check if the adversary is, um, is able to produce, to, to break the system or not. And the game in the computational binding case is quite simple. The challenger samples a key, sends it over to the adversary, and the adversary replies with two openings. And the adversary wins if the openings are valid to distinct bits. Uh, so another way of stating that the that a scheme is computationally binding is that uh, no polynomial time adversary can win with this game with more than negligible probability. Okay, so that's computational binding. Let me move on to some binding, uh, which is characterized by the following game, which is slightly different. So as before, the challenger samples a key, sends it to the adversary, and now the adversary sends a commitment stream. So the, it could either be playing honestly, in which case the adversary chose a bit, chose an opening, and then computed the commitment according to these, uh, or it might be doing something different, this cheating. And now, only after receiving the commitment, the challenger will sample a random bit and ask the adversary to open to that bit. <clears throat> and now the adversary replies with an opening, and it wins if the opening is valid to the bit the challenger asked for. So note that if the adversary is just playing honestly, it can win this game with probability one half quite easily, right? It just chooses a fixed bit and commits and decommits according to it. So we'll say that a commitment scheme is some binding if no polynomial time adversary can beat this sort of trivial one half probability by much. Okay, so this is like the comparison between the two. And let me just mention that, you know, like why do we care about these things? Well, it turns out that like, Security proofs for like different different in different settings might rely on something that looks more like one game versus something that looks more like the other, um, and it would be interesting if we could you know prove that these things are equivalent. In the classical case, this turns out to be the case, and I'll try to give you like a short. The, the proof of this is really not too complicated. And anyway, if I could choose one thing for you to remember from from this talk, it would probably be uh, this. This is like a neat five minute introduction to cryptography in a sense. Okay, so uh, we want to prove that computational and some binding are equivalent. The way we do this is generally via the contrapositives. So we assume that the scheme is not computational, computationally binding, and we'll try to prove that it's not some binding. So if a scheme is not computationally binding, there exists some uh, adversary that wins the computational binding game with larger probability than it should, right? with inverse polynomial probability. Um, now, what we'll do is we'll use the, the computationally binding, computational binding adversary to construct the sum binding adversary. So we just hand off the key that we received from the challenger to the computational binding adversary, let it run for some polynomial amount of time, and it'll reply with two openings. Maybe they're valid, maybe they're not. So if they're valid to different bits, then we can just continue playing the game with this common uh, string here, that is the commitment to both cases. And if the, the, the two openings are not valid to distinct bits, then we'll just have the sum binding adversary play honest. So note that if the computational binding adversary wins, then the sum binding adversary also wins because regardless of the bit that the challenger is going to ask for, we have one opening that's valid for that bit. And in the case where the computational binding adversary loses, well, then we just have the, the sum binding adversary play honestly, so it wins with probability one half. So if we aggregate these probabilities together, and we have uh, an epsilon probability of the 
computational binary adversary winning, and therefore there's some binary adversary winning. And then in the complement event, the sum binary adversary wins with probability one half. So we can just rearrange this and see that indeed the sum binary adversary wins with inverse polynomial uh, advantage. Okay, so this is one of the directions. Now let me uh, go through the second, which is that uh, computational binding implies some binding. And, and as usual, we'll do this via the contrapositive. So we assume that there is some adversary for the sum binding game that wins with inverse polynomial advantage over one half. And we'll use this to construct a computational binding adversary. So as before, you know, we get a key from the challenger, simulate the sum binding adversary with that key, and then it will send its first message with just some commitment string. And I will do something that is slightly cleverer than last time, which is we're going to save the internal memory state of the sum binding adversary. Remember that because we're simulating it, we have access not only to its messages, but also to its internal memory. So we'll save a snapshot of its internal memory and then continue the sum binding game in the two possible ways. First, we ask it for to open to the bit zero. It'll give us some opening. Then it'll, we'll ask it to open to the bit one. It'll give us some hopefully different opening. And we'll send these two openings to the, uh, you know, in the computational binding game. Now, we know that um, the sum binding adversary wins with inverse polynomial advantage. And it's not too hard to show. These are just like some sort of Markov type uh, inequalities that with at least half epsilon probability over the key space, the sum binding adversary wins under that key for both bits zero and one with probability at least epsilon. And because we're sort of like running all these things with fresh randomness, the probability that the um, computational binding adversary wins is just the product of all these three. And because epsilon is inverse polynomial, so is epsilon cubed. And therefore, um, the, this adversary that we constructed does indeed achieve inverse polynomial advantage in the computational binding game. OK, so I understand if this, is, uh, this was a bit quick. Um, if you have any questions, please like, feel free to interrupt. I don't know if there's any way of doing this online. Um, but uh, I do want to highlight that like, this is sort of like the main thing I wanted to communicate. I will go through two different proofs. Uh, but in, for these, I'll, try, I'll uh, sort of like hide some things under the, um, that, that they're not going to be entirely obvious. But for these two, this is actually the complete proof. OK, so that sort of concludes the introduction to classical cryptography. Now let's move on to classical cryptography with quantum adversaries. And here, it's not too hard to see that like there is a very big problem that shows up if we just try to reproduce these two uh, proofs in the quantum case. Namely, when we want to prove that not some binding implies not computational binding, we save a snapshot of the internal state of the adversary and then we use it twice, right? So in the quantum case, this would amount to taking some arbitrary quantum state, copying it, and then using one copy for each run. But of course, we know by the no cloning theorem that we can't do this. Uh, and in fact, um, it's not known one way or the other, but it is feasible that a sum binding adversary uh, could opening to open to either zero or one with probability very, very close to one in both cases, but, rather, but it's still not, a, not able to open to both. So what will happen here is that there is like some very special quantum state uh, that we can use to open to either of these two. But when we do, we, uh, we apply some measurement and we completely destroy the state. And we can't reuse the, the post-measurement state to try and open to the other bit. And in fact, this will uh, show up at, at the end of this talk again. Um, OK, so you know we have a problem. Uh, one way to fix this, and in fact, this, is, uh, this has been very fruitful, like many um, security proofs that broke down in the quantum case can be fixed by this stronger notion of co collapse binding. So I'll introduce a third and last game, uh, which is slightly different from uh, the previous two in, in a couple of different ways. The first way is that this will be a quantum game. So there will be quantum messages sent back and forth. And the second difference uh, I'll mention uh, at the end of the slide. OK, so as before, you know, the challenger samples a key, sends it to the adversary. And now the adversary will reply uh, uh, not only with a commitment, as in the sum binding game, but with a commitment and a quantum state, a quantum state in a bit and in opening registers. 
So at this point, the challenger uh, will sort of like flip a coin and depending on the coin flip, it'll measure the bit register or not. Then it sends the, the two registers back to the adversary. And now the adversary's task is to guess whether the uh, challenger measured or not. So it will send a guess. And you know if it guesses that the, the challenger measured when it did, it wins. And, vice, and likewise, uh, if the challenger did not measure and um, yeah, if it did not measure and the adversary guesses that it did not measure. Um, now this might look a bit odd, um, but let me, so there is one key uh, thing that we have to add to this, which is, well, you know, the game itself has nothing to do with the, with the, um, um, with the commitment scheme. So we need to ensure that whatever this quantum state is that the reverse three sends, it must be a superposition of valid bits and openings with respect to this uh, commitment. It's not too hard to change this uh, game to allow the adversary to send anything it wants, but the two things are equivalent and this like, simplifies proofs a bit, so we'll stick with this. And let me just remark that, you know, while this might seem like a rather strange um, scheme or a rather strange condition, basically what this is saying is that whenever the adversary has a superposition of valid things, uh, it's basically as useful as just having a distribution over valid things because it cannot distinguish whether this, you know, perhaps very complicated uh, superposition over many things has been measured or not. So it, it's sort of saying like whatever quantumness the adversary has cannot be exploited by means like interference and whatnot. Okay, so this is the collapse binding game. And now um, I'll go through, uh, you know, the, the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the slides are, uh, have quite a bit of text, but I'll try to go through the main idea mainly. Uh, we'll show that collapse binding is equivalent to some binding. Um, and, you know, as before, note that like there's a very simple strategy with which the adversary can win the probability of half. You can just get guess the, the bit that determines whether the ch challenger measured at random. And we say that, you know, a scheme is collapse binding if a no poly time quantum adversary can win this with probability much more than a half. Okay. So it turns out that in fact, like the other direction that works in the classical case also works in the quantum case. So we know that some binding applies uh, computational binding, which is a know if the converse holds. And what we'll prove now is that collapse binding implies some binding. This is something that has been proven before uh, by Unruh, but we extend this proof and arguably simplify it by uh, also extending it to like the quantum commitment and to string commitments as well. Okay, so um, here's uh, how the proof goes. We'll first assume uh, without loss of generality that uh, if we have a sum binding adversary, well, whatever sum binding adversary you have in our hands, uh, the way that it provides an opening is by applying some special unitary to the bit that re it received plus the internal state that it has. So the bit lives in the bit register <clears throat> and this uh, internal state lives in an opening register plus some extra workspace. Then it measures the opening register and sends whatever outcome that is. So we can assume this is how the sum binding adversary behaves without loss of generality. Okay, so we'll use this unitary to construct a collapse binding adversary. And as before, we'll prove the contrapositive. We assume that we have a sum binding adversary that wins with inverse polynomial advantage, and we'll construct an adversary that wins the collapse binding game with two larger probability. Okay, so how do we do this? As before, you know, we just feed the sum binding adversary some key. And then it'll send some commitment, but we'll also make use of the internal state of the sum binding adversary. So this is similar to the case where we were saving a snapshot. The difference here is that we can manipulate this internal state. We can't copy it. So we'll have to figure some way of using this internal state without copying it. Okay. Um, and now remember that you know we sort of know how the the this protocol, you know, what the success probability is if we set this bit register to be in the maximum mix state. So zero probability a half, one probability a half. And the main trick here is that, well, we can set it to be whatever you want. So we'll set the state in this bit register to be the superposition of zero and one. Okay, so then we'll check that the, um, the commit and opening registers are invalid superpositions with respect to this uh, commitment. This is just some projective measurement that we apply. 
and then we'll send off you know the commit and um, the commitment string and the bid and opening registers. Now, if the check fails, then at the end we'll just guess randomly. So for now, let's assume the check succeeds. So we are indeed in a superposition of valid bits and openings. Now the challenger will send back the two uh, registers. It may or may not have, have measured them. So what it'll do is we'll uncompute the this unitary that we applied earlier, and then measure the bit register in the Hadamard basis. That'll give us some outcome, and we send this outcome as a response. Okay, so that's basically it. We do need to argue that this works, right? So I want to argue that uh, at first that there are two cases in which we know exactly what the success probability is going to be. So if this check fails up here, then the adversary will guess randomly, so it'll succeed with probability one half. Likewise, if the challenger decides to measure, then the bit register will collapse to some computational basis state, and we're going to measure this computational basis state in the Hardamard basis. So again, we'll get the correct answer with probability a half. So then all that remains to, to show is that you know, whenever everything goes right, so if the check succeeds, the uh, challenger decides not to measure and the adversary wins, then we win with sufficiently high probability. And this just makes use of um, a generalization, like a simpler proof of something that was proven by um, Crepeau, Simar, um, Tap, and um, I forgot what the fourth person was, uh, which essentially says the following intuitively. If we have a quantum state that we can use to do two different computations, and both of them succeed with sufficiently high probability, then we can actually execute them in sequence and both will succeed with, with non-negligible probability. Um, and in our case, the two computations are like, you know, applying this uh, projective measurement that checks if the commitment is valid and measuring the plus minus basis. Okay, so if we put that all together, we do indeed conclude that the collapse lightning adversary wins with inverse polynomial advantage. Okay, and again, let me remark that like if this is not, if you haven't followed this, please do not worry. Feel free to take a look at the longer video where I go this in, through this in, in some more detail. Okay, so that was uh, one of the directions. So we're like one of our main contributions is proving the converse. So collapse binding implies some binding and vice versa. Some binding implies collapse binding. And this is sort of like our, one of our main contributions. So this is how this like landscape looked uh, like uh, so far. We have like some very strong notion of binding that we didn't know if it was equivalent to some other natural notion. We proved that these two are equivalent. Okay. Uh, and I promise this will be the, the last proof. Um, so we want to prove that if a scheme is not collapse binding, then it's not some binding. So we'll use a collapse binding adversary to construct a sum binding adversary. As before, you know, we'll just feed the key to the adversary that we have. Now, because it's a collapse binding adversary, it will reply with some commitment and a superposition of our bits and openings. Now note that because the collapse binding adversary uh, always replies with a valid superposition, we can always just measure the bit register and see, you know, uh, and we know that we'll be able to open to this bit. Now, we'll send the challenge back to the, uh, sorry, send the commitment back to the challenger. And at this point, the challenger will ask for us to open to some bit, some bit B. Now, we obtained this bit B prime before. If we're lucky enough that these two bits match, then we know that the uh, opening register is in a valid superposition, like is in a superposition of valid openings. So we just measure it and send the corresponding opening. In this case, we are ensured that we'll win the sum binding game. Now, of course, it could be the case that the bit that we obtained before is not equal to the bit that the challenger asked for. In that case, we're going to use the collapse binding adversary to give us a second chance at making the same measurement. So we'll send you know, the bit and opening registers back to the collapse binding adversary, and the adversary will apply with a guess a bit and some internal state. Now note that from the collapse binding adversary's point of view, it should guess one, right? Because the bit was measured. But in fact, we'll completely disregard this and only use the internal state that the collapse binding adversary has. Okay. So what we'll do is now we have this bit and opening registers again, we just measure the bit register along with an opening. If we're lucky enough that the second measurement gave us something different from the first, then we send the corresponding opening. 
And now this is, of course, not obvious, but uh, one like we prove a technical lemma that basically says that the larger the probability the collapsed by any adversary uh, can distinguish between measured and non-measured, the larger the probability that these two uh, measurements are yield distinct outcomes. So by plugging all that in, you know, the, what is the probability that the sum by any adversary wins? Well, either it got the right bit the first time around, or it got the wrong bit the first time around, but the, the right bit the second time around. So then we just plug in uh, all these things. You know, this this is one half. This is related to this probability uh, of distinguishing here, and we obtain um, inverse polynomial advantage in this case as well. Okay, so this sort of like concludes the the part about like um, uh, you know notions of, of binding and equivalence or not between them. Now let me mention very briefly, I'm not gonna get into uh, any details of proofs of some applications of quantum rewinding. So I should highlight that this is not exactly how things are written down in the, in the conference version of the paper, but we'll try to, we'll hopefully make uh, the full version with this, these updates available soon. So this, the, the two applications rely on one common lemma, which is uh, how we can take an arbitrary adversary and make it structured. So, um, oh. sorry. Yes. Can um, you hear us? Oh, sorry. Uh, am I running out of time? I'm sorry about this. Um... Uh, yeah, it, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear okay, me? yeah, it'd be good if you could like wrap up within the next minute or two. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right then. So, so let me just give you like a very high level idea of how this is going. Um, you know, a sum binding adversary could win with, uh, you know, the, the success probability of a sum binding adversary could look like many different things with respect to the key space. You know, maybe it wins with probability one in a some somewhat large fraction of the key space and zero elsewhere, or it wins with the same probability everywhere, all over the place, and so on. There are like many different shapes or you know, different distributions this, uh, this could um, look like. And what we do is we can take an arbitrary adversary and make it structured in the sense that for a small but not negligible part of the key space, we can take we can construct an adversary that wins with probability almost one. And now this relies on some uh, quantum singular value algorithms, which we'll all not get into. Um, but let me remark that you know, uh, to our main result in this setting is that while we can't prove the converse, like computational binding implies some binding, what we can show is that if a, there exists a scheme that is in this gap that is computationally but not some binding, then we can construct interesting cryptography from it. So remember that, like in the uh, a scheme is not some binding if it can open if a scheme is not some binding, then it can open to any bit with inverse polynomial probability. There is a stronger notion where it can open to any bit with probability very close to one, and we prove that you know if a scheme is in this gap, then it can be made into this special kind of committed scheme that implies all sorts of quantum cryptography. Okay, and for this like upcoming result, let me just mention that we can also prove uh, a converse to a very recent result by Kieza, Ma, Spooner, and Zendry, where they prove that Keeling's protocol is uh, post-quantum secure if instantiated with a collapsing hash function. We show that if the hash function is not collapsing, then the scheme is insecure. So to prove this proves that this result is tight. Okay, so thanks for listening and I'm um, happy to take any questions if there are any. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, we'll have time for like one or two quick questions, so. Hi. Um, Thanks for your talk. My question is this last comment you made about proving that something's post-quantum secure. What exactly do you mean by that? And is this at all related to something that could be implementable, like with the with like the post-quantum codes that people are trying to implement where they're not sure if it's post-quantum secure, but you think it is. So if you're proving something is secure, maybe I don't understand exactly what you mean here, but is there any sort of um, like way to, to implement these? Um, I guess, you know, could you implement bit commitment unconditionally anyway? Um, it kind of in that in that direction. Okay, oh, th this is a great question. Um, so I should remark that like collapsing hash functions are a stronger notion than collision resistant hash functions. So this is all 
conditional on on something that is even stronger than uh, collision resistance, which we can't prove unconditionally, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, th this is all conditional on something that's even stronger than what we can what we know to be true in the classical case. Okay, I think that helps. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, maybe one quick final question. Maybe you can like very briefly comment on why or why not these general rewinding techniques of like Alex and Fermi and, and so on. It, it sounds like you had to do a sort of fair amount of custom work. So why don't those general techniques work here? Um, in fact, we did not have to do that, that much uh, custom work. We, we could just, so um, there are these two sort of like general quantum rewinding, uh, like, you know, QSVT algorithms that we can essentially just take and, and apply to our case. Uh, I mean, of course, that looks like there's some amount of customization, but it's it's minor. Uh, this really is, and this is sort of like a mo more recent version of the of the previous work where they proved um, uh, Killian is post quantum secure. Um, this is yeah, this this is like a, sort of like a more modern instantiation of these, and we can essentially use them uh, by just like restating the, the the algorithms and using them as they are. The thing that makes it more modern is like the QSVT of uh, Marriott Watrous inside of Metro Marriott Watrous, or okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So, yeah. All right, then. If there are no further questions, um, let's thank all the speakers from the session again. All right. Thank you.